Hi there and welcome to Reinhard Sint episode number 5. Since top 3 or top 5 or top 10 whatever videos are popular, I decided to do a top something video as well. On Facebook synthesizer repair and other forums, I often see problems being mentioned with synthesizers which are just often instances of a couple of common faults. So which common faults do you ask? Well, I decided to go scientific on this one and do a bit of statistical analysis on the repairs and fix wrappers I let go through my hands the last 7 years. Well, look, as a hobby, I buy broken or slightly broken synthesizers, which I try to repair and sell on. And with the money I make, I buy more broken synths and repair kit to fill up my workbench. Nice. <laughs> so based on this, I came up with a top eight. Plus an honorable mention and a bonus entry, as you always have to do. So without further ado, here we go. And at number 8 we have leaking caps. It happens but not as often as rumor have it. If a cap leaks it loses its function and causes a myriad of faults like no audio or low level audio or distortion on the audio or one of the voltage rails is just not working. You get spurious resets, you get just too many faults to mention. So how do you know if you have a leaky cap? Visual inspection. Well, first of course you need to know how a comp capacitor looks like and to be more precise an electrolytic capacitor because these are the ones that leak. Here are some examples. These electrolytic capacitors use in their internals an electrolyte, which is the fluid that sometimes leaks out. And this is a nasty corrosive fluid that does some nasty things with your electronics. Well, to begin with, these are not leaking caps. This is just elastic junk to keep the capacitors from shaping loose or cause dry joints. And more on that later. Now, these are leaking caps. Like on the power supply board of a TX802, the audio output of an R70 drum computer, or here on a, in the sample and hold electronics of an SG1 digital piano, here in the mute circuitry of a Roland JP8000, or like this one on the back of an LCD display of a Korg 01W. Well, if you find them, remove them, remove all of the electrolytes using some isopropanol alcohol, and make sure no traces are affected. Then replace them with same or similar electrolytic capacitors, a similar meaning here that at least the same or higher voltage rating, that's very important, and the same capacitance value. If you, if you choose a lower uh, voltage rating, they might even explode in normal operation, and they, you don't want that. And at number seven, we have dry solder joints. Temperature stress and repetitive mechanical load by, for instance, plugging or unplugging cables from a jack can cause solder joints to fail. How hard to find? Difficult if not obvious. You really have to have a close look, preferably with a lightest magnifier, Audio and foot switch jacks are the easy ones because they, when they work, when you wiggle them, it's mostly a dry joint. Uh, hard ones are temperature related ones when, where the component is cold, it has not expanded yet and the solder makes contact, but when getting hotter the component expands and make, might break the PCD contact. Typical example of that are the voltage, voltage regulators in a Kawai K5M module. All the solder joints of the regulators to the PCB were dry that made no contact with the traces. Even more difficult to find is when the fault appears random. I had this one on a Roland S50 where the display flickered and tapping on the case might make or break the contacts. Anyway, the solution is very simple. Make sure there's no mechanical stress on the PCB contacts and just resolder them. Easy peasy. Next, at number 6, we have power supply problems. Psst, shall I let you in on secret? The number one rule of synthesizer repair? Okay, it's this. <laughs> Before you even look any further into a fault, always, always check if all voltage rails are there and are present on all the boards. This is the number one rule to follow and save me a going down rabbit holes and not doing it did, did send me down rabbit holes, boy. Uh, typically in synthesizers you find a voltage rail for the digital logic like 5 or 3 top. 3.3 volt and a positive and negative voltage rail for the analog stage plus minus 12 15 or 18 volts if the digital logic rail does not work the synth does not boot if the analog rail is not there the synth might boot but and appear to be working but there's no audio so reasons why a power supply might not be working are very diverse so one or more of the voltage regulators are not working or uh, the capacitors are too old, dry, or do not function anymore, and that's not always because of leakage. 
the bridge rectifier is broken. Uh, this happened on a XP50. Uh, some EMI capacitor uh, blew. Had this on an EX5. A protection diode blew because wrong polarity power brick was plugged in. Uh, that happened to me on a Waldorf Micro Q. Or the fuse just blew. Uh, but careful this one, by the way. Why did it blew? But best thing to do is work your way back from the output and see where the item fault is. I have never seen a transformer fail, although they can, and but most often it was really a regulator or a capacitor. Um, one remark, please, please be careful when working with switch mode power supplies. The, the primary side of such a power supply carries three or four hundred volts DC and touching that can kill you. So make sure that you know what you are touching and measuring and when replacing parts, please make sure the main cap is discharged. Item number five, please. Pots or slider malfunction. I'm not talking about encoders, you know, those knobs that have no start or end point. More on that later. Uh, but just the analog potentiometers like volume knobs and sliders. Uh, due to wear and tear or dirt getting into them, they start to fail. Most common side effect for volume knobs and sliders is that you will hear some scratching while turning or moving it. And if it's a value slider, you will see jumps while moving it, or it just cannot reach the minimum or maximum value, or it just does not work at all. There are three ways to solve those malfunctioning pots or sliders. Well, the best way is, of course, to replace them with new ones. Uh, second best is to spray some slider pot or contact spray into it. Well, actually not normal contact spray, please, um, but special uh, spray for, for sliders and faders. I uh, get good results with the Dioxid F5 fader loop. Um, or if the above does not work and new ones are unobtainium, open them up, clean thoroughly and make sure the resistive element is still intact. Did not see many successes with this approach, but if it's the last option, you will have to risk it. Um, finding a replacement pot or slider is admittedly not that easy. Uh, there are online shops specialized in among, in among others pots and slider replacements for synthesizers, but they often charge three or four times the price you would pay in normal electronic part shops. But if you want to go the easy route and pay a bit more, for Europe I can recommend synthparts.com from Germany or vintagesynthparts.com from Italy. Uh, for the USA I recommend synthtower.com. If you want to go cheaper, you have to dig deep through endless codes, shaft types and lengths, variants, brands, qualities, etc. on electronic part platforms like Mauser, DigiKey or Ars Components. All the links are in the comment section below. Next! At number four, we have broken keys and or button caps. This is more a mechanical issue, not an electronic one. When you buy second-hand synthesizers, always have a close look at the keys and the buttons. When an underlying tech switch is not working properly, people just press hard on the button and after a while the plastic button cap will break. For instance, on a Cork M1, the button will sink into the chassis and it, if you take it apart, you will find a plastic button assembly with a broken off button cap. Similar for keys on the keypad, but here it is more caused either by material fatigue, I did a whole video on this for the Yamaha P120, accidents or medical reasons, and I'm not joking here. Uh, to get replacement buttons for current synths is easy. Just contact your local synth dealer, which can order them directly from the supplier. When doing this, make sure to provide a good description, or even better, the part number of the button cap concerned as from the service manual. To get replacement button caps for all the synths is harder. Here you really have to search on eBay or just buy a donor synth to use the button caps from. Through the years I collected some button caps and have some stock for future repairs, but it is not much. Replacement keys is much easier. Here there is enough supply of new and used keys on eBay for old and current synths. Um, search and you will find. I personally keep a stock of synth keys I often work on and primarily for the Yamaha keys, uh, like for the FS keybit as used in the DX7, but also in the Korg M1 by the way, and also of course uh, some piano keys for the GH keybit. Which gives me a nice segue to number three, keybit contact problems. When keys do not trigger a note when pressed, or it has an uneven velocity response, or always triggers at full volume, you have a keypad contact problem. In 70% of the cases you can solve these by carefully cleaning these contacts. Nowadays almost all suppliers use rubber domes with rubber contacts on them to close contacts on the keypad PCB. 
it are these rubber contacts and PCB contacts that need some cleaning. Just remove all dust and clean the contacts with pure alcohol. Sometimes that does not work, and in most of the cases this can be solved by replacing the rubber dome strip, which can be found new or used at eBay, can be ordered at your local SIN dealer, or bought at one of my recommended online shops. Seldom, but not too seldom, a liquid soda spill into the keybed attacked the traces on the keybed contact PCB. Again here, clean the PCB with alcohol and make sure none of the traces are interrupted. And if so, repair them. If you have a whole block of keys or there are recurring patterns of keys not working, for instance every eighth key does not work, you might have a case of broken keypad PCB traces. So look them up and repair them. If non-rubber dome metal contacts are used, carefully clean the contacts with alcohol or deoxid. And actually the FS keybed shown here is actually my favorite synth keybed. It is, if I recall correctly, for the first time used in the DX7 in 1983 and consequently used in, for instance, the, the DX7 Mark II, the Quark M1, T2 and 3, the WaveStation, the Yamaha SY1799 and Triton and has been used up until the Motive ES from 2006. It uses metal springs with small gold wires as contacts, and these contacts never oxidize and need little cleaning. And the keybed itself plays very nice as well, so lovely. And at number two we have LCD backlight issues. This is a big one. Very often I see synths with faded or non-functioning LCD backlights. Uh, mind you, not all synths with LCDs have backlights on them. Famously, the DX7 Mark I, the TX7 and the original Roland XP10 had LCDs without backlights. But these can be replaced with standard LCDs with backlights, but more on that later. Um, there are basically three types of LCD backlights one most encounters. Electroluminescent foils, cold cathode fluorescent lamps, CCFLs, and light emitting di diodes, LEDs. Uh, side note, organic LED, like OLED, uh, is de facto not a backlight technology. It is an LCD display where the pixels emit light themselves. But that's a different topic. So what are those uh, backlight technologies? First of all, the electroluminescent one. Actually, this is a very big paper thin flat capacitor with one side being transparent and the dielectric being a phosphorus based material that lights up when a high AC voltage with a high frequency is applied. This voltage is supplied by an inverter that also often causes the whine one hears when it operates. Be very, very quiet. But these are not used anymore because they do not age well and need additional electronics for the high voltage supply needed. Just too much trouble compared to LEDs. However, in the late 80s and early 90s, these were heavily used as backlights for large as LCDs, as used in, for instance, the Cork 01W or the Yamaha SY77. Luckily, there are now standard replacement screens available with LED backlights. One can still get replacement backlight foils from, for instance, uh, Backlight for you, but in my experience, these foils are not as bright as the original ones. I recommend to replace the whole display with a LED backlit one. Much brighter, better contrast and better long longevity. Next one, cold cathode fluorescent lamps, CCFL. I have actually only encountered them as backlights for the Quark Trinity and Quark Triton. Uh, these also need a high voltage to light up and are almost not used anymore. Again, LED is much superior. They fail because of electrode wear out. And if you need to replace them, of course, you can get them at uh, backlight for you or you can go the hardcore route and replace them with a string of white back backlight LEDs as done for similar displays in this video. Not easy, but much better results. Uh, then the best one, the light emitting diodes, LED. This is the prevailing and recommended backlight technology. Most new LCD displays use LED backlighting, but also these fail, although after many more hours than the before mentioned backlight technologies. Well, how to repair them? You can either replace a complete LCD display with a display with uh, standard built-in LED backlighting, or you can replace the LED lighting, or you can really go the difficult way, and that is make your own backlight assembly if new displays or backlight assemblies are not available anymore for normal prices, I mean. Well, 
to, com to replace the complete LCD display, re replace them with new ones. And most displays used are commercial off-the-shelf displays, which can still be bought. Incredible if you think about it. You can still get an off-the-shelf LCD display that is a drop-in replacement for the DX7. That's almost 40 years that these displays are produced. Incredible. The tricky bit with new displays is always the contrast voltage. These differ between the old and new displays. And this is where most display replacement projects go wrong, if you do not take this into account. Too many different ways to solve them, and one of them I explained in the Rhinat SIN number 4, the Quark T2 display replacement video. I made a small document listing which display can be used in which synthesizer and what to do with uh, regarding to the contrast voltage to get, to get it in the right range. Uh, the file I have linked in the comments. Replacing the backlight LEDs. Sometimes it is just the LED that is broken, and this LED can be replaced with a new one. Uh, just make sure, of course, that the voltage and luminance is just right. Backlight LEDs are a special kind of LEDs and are available in many different shapes and characteristics. Doing this and finding the correct LED can be quite finicky, by the way. You might also find that the LCD used is a custom-built LCD. Um, here you have to get creative and uh, in how to replace the backlight. For instance, here I did it for a Boss Dr. Rhythm 880. There I had to replace uh, the small SMD LED string with a string of 3mm sized standard LEDs and somehow make it fit. But it came out rather nice, I think, if I may say so. Um, last but not least, you can replace the whole backlight assembly. Okay, here it gets really tricky. Especially useful for Akai uh, sampler displays. These are unobtainium, at least for the normal prices. And um, of course, you, with these displays, you could uh, you could use a new EL foil uh, for to use as a backlight. But really, this does not result in a bright, good, readable display. You could also buy a complete new display, but these are very expensive, north of 100 euros, and most often too expensive compared with the value of the Akai S sampler. An innovative option is the following. Use the backlight for a mobile phone. These are very thin, very bright, uh, but it does require some handiwork and additional components to make them fit. Um, if I come to it, I will make a special video about it. But in the meantime, go to this page for an excellent explanation how to do this. Well, or there's also uh, still some other ways to solve backlight problems. Here I did it for an Alasis S4. I found an LCD in an electronics dumpster with a backlight that fitted just right. Just had to trim the edges, fit it in, and voila, instead of a green backlight, I had a white backlit LCD display. Now, to close the section off, I recommend the uh, Music Gear Display Retrofits group on Facebook. When asking for help, please do some homework first, like finding out the type of display concerned, the pinout, etc., before asking for help. This way, the group members can provide the most efficient help. Before we go to number one, uh, a honorable mention. Uh, it's not a fault as such, it doesn't stop your synth from working, but man, synths need some cleaning. Um, of course, it doesn't stop working when it's covered with dust, finger fat, spit, sweat residue, beer, mucus, snot, mice poo or piss, dandruff, shall I go on? Man, synths can get dirty. Here, a collage of things I had to deal with. Cleaning can actually be a moment of zen in the whole process of restoring and synthesizing, in my personal opinion. Um, to clean surfaces, I just use a paper towel dampened with normal fluid household cleaner. Uh, to clean button caps, mod wheels, encoder knobs, etc., I use my ultrasound cleaner I bought cheaply on eBay. And to clean the keys, the things that need cleaning most, by the way, uh, I also use paper towels dampened with normal household cleaner. And for troublesome, troublesome spots, I use some isopropanol, isopropanol alcohol. And now, ladies and gentlemen, number one is Corroded Switch Contacts. Yeah, the, the most common fault I find in synths is a malfunctioning switch or, or an encoder on the control surface due to oxidization of the internal switch contacts. Um, it happens to sliding switch contacts, tactile switch contacts, and of course the contacts inside an encoder. All of them will succumb to oxidization or wear and tear. So how to deal with them? Well, you can soak them in contact spray. No. No, no, just don't. 
this just gives temporal relief, creates a big mess, and is just masking the underlying issue of oxidized contacts. Definitely a no-no in my book. Uh, the best thing to do is to replace them. And while you're at it, and the synth is opened, and opened up already, uh, not only replace the faulty switches, but replace them all, because if one fails, the other one will fail shortly after that. This is the only reliable way, in my opinion. <clears throat> but luckily, most switches can still be bought new and for low prices at bulk. Again, if you do not want to do the search work on Mauser or other sites, go to the aforementioned synth parts online shops, where you can find most of the switches, switches and pay a bit more. <clears throat> I myself try to keep a healthy stock of common tactile switches and encoders, and this way I almost always have the right switch for repair at hand. What you could also do is buy one of those sets with multiple switch types on like eBay or Amazon or Banggood. Uh, they do not cost much and you have a healthy supply of spare switches. And the same goes for encoders. Please have a look at the uh, Quark microcontroller video, uh, Reinhard Sint number 2, where I explain how to find the right encoder replacement. And what if, the switch, what if the switch or encoder you want to replace does not exist anymore? Best is to carefully open it and clean the metal contacts inside with alcohol and contact spray. Last but not least, the bonus section. Things that did not make the top 8. Like I said in the beginning, this top 8 is based on synthesizers which I bought broken or just slightly broken and repairs I did for friends. Um, things that did not make this top 8 are low frequency faults like broken PCBs like here on the M1 power supply or a Yamaha Air Mix 1, uh, rubber standoffs in a Kurzweil K2500 rack going all gooey or ICs going bad. And actually by the number of since I handled ICs like digital to analog converters or EPROMs or CPUs etc. do not go bad that often. But when they do, these are the most interesting ones to service and fix. And the weirdest fault I had to fix you ask? Well it has to be this one. Replacing an encoder on a Roland RD2000. This was a something fell off a bookshelf and on a RD2000 stage piano incident, which broke off the shaft of two encoders. And the original owner had a very peculiar idea on how to fix this. It filled the whole encoder with super glue and put the knob back on. Now, why does it not turn anymore? Uh, no idea. Well, using cotton buds dabbed in acetone, I carefully had to dissolve away the super glue layer by layer and then I had to put on some new uh, red SMD LEDs and a new rotary knob LED surround assembly to fix it. But in it, it came out very nice. Well then, this concludes this episode, which was all talk this time, but I hope you enjoyed it. If there are questions, just leave them in the comments. Bye.